So, your uncle. What's wrong with him? He's possessed. As in the devil? Something like that. He says a dark man is following him. Watching him at all times. What do you make of it? It's nonsense, of course. But I'd be lying if I said it didn't bother me. You see, it runs in my family. Possession? No, detective. Deteriorating melancholy. Practically every member of the Hartwood family is driven mad before they grow old. But Jeremy didn't kill himself. Is that why he's at your setup? Despite being convinced that he is truly possessed, he decided to put his last chips on Dr. Gray and his psychoanalysis, figuring he might stumble upon some cure. You mentioned the letter. I received a disturbing letter from Jeremy accusing the staff and all the other patients of being involved in some cult. And now they are also out to get him. Could it be real? Or is it all just in his head? It's a story he tells himself, Mr. Carnby. Anything to avoid the truth. Which is? That we're all terribly insignificant. That people mean so very little to one another. That there is no one out to get Jeremy Hartwood because he isn't worth getting. And here we are. My uncle's not well, Mr. Carnby. I want to make sure he's all right. Then what's my part in this? You couldn't get a cab? I just wouldn't feel safe going alone. Did you bring a gun? Yeah. You think it'll actually come to that? No. But you might need to wave it around depending on how agreeable the staff will be. What exactly are we going to do when we find Jeremy? I don't know. Let's just find him first. abandoned. It can't be. There has to be someone around. Wait here. I'll go around back. Now what do we got here? Getting in there. Hmm. Oh. 
I need the key. Mind if I do? Every day your silence weighs a little heavier. It's been a difficult year for everyone and many have lost all hope. I read in the papers about people suffering. Pictures of dust-covered landscapes without a drop of water. I wish I knew if you were still tending the earth or if you had turned your back against us. I have started to look for help elsewhere. I pray you will tell me if I am going down a path that you find disagreeable. With help from Batiste and Charlotte, I found comfort in the practice of the voodoo. I have long been skeptical of that Caribbean cult, but it's been of good use to me. It seems all harmless in my book. I say some words dreamt up by the Creoles, and I carry around a small pocket of Grigri. Nothing of this is mentioned in the Bible, of course, but the French court of priestess tells me it's all connected. She says the Christian God is just one more perspective on the creator of things. That's what I like to think, but the other way around, that the spirits of her faith are just aspects of you, our Heavenly Father. I am so grateful for the words you gave Mr. Hartwood. We will sing your praises at St. John's Eve. The world will be blessed soon again. Only the sacrifices of the Old Testament compare to your demands. Let it be the truth. A mother of earth, wood, and dirt. A mother of a thousand young. that. Please do not touch the boiler. It is working after all. While the sabotage has caused a leak, only the decorative plate has been completely ruined. Let's wait for Mr. Chance to turn up and he can take a look at the leak. Mr. Waits. That doesn't look safe.
Sunday, June 22nd. I spent all day looking for Jeremy. I should have cared for the others, but I'm scared that he will do something irreversible. Cassandra is upset that I didn't give her the latest shipment of pain medication that Waits brought from the post office yesterday. I would have given it to her, but the company didn't send a new key this time around, so the box is just sitting there on my desk. They must have figured we had plenty of their gimmicky keys by now. I only remember seeing one lately. Grace was playing with it inside the grand parlor. Unless it turns up by itself, it will have to wait. I have to figure out where Jeremy is. I think Jack knew something. That dog of his found a strange rot permeating the house. She's showing us, he said. Like those blots and streaks of fetid rot was talking to him. I need the key. The Great Depression. President Hoover raises tariffs on over 20,000 imported goods in an act to protect American labor. Following the collapse of the Wall Street stock market on October 24 last year, American industry has suffered greatly. Thousands of companies have gone bankrupt and left a large part of the American workforce unemployed. In an attempt to turn the tide, the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act has been signed by President Herbert Hoover. By regulating commerce with foreign countries, the government hopes to encourage the industries of the United States to compete with cheap foreign imports. Superstition on Rise New Orleans voodoo stores and spiritual mediums see increased profit during troubled times. While the market has faced hard times ever since Black Thursday of last year, voodoo doctors and snake charmers see significant rise in number of customers. With the coming eve of St. John on the 23rd, the police expect increased cult activity around Bayou St. John, the southern shore of Lake Pontchartrain. Voodoo rituals in that area on the eve of St. John have a long tradition reaching back to the first snake worshippers brought as slaves from West Africa. During the 19th century, its practice was popularized by the legendary Marie Laveau, and has since been embraced by many of the Creoles and the surviving aristocracy of the French Quarter. Author Seeks Asylum Rumors regarding author Cassandra Beauregard making Dorsetto her home verified. Dorsetto Hospital is an old plantation building on the eastern shores of Lake Pontchartrain. While often considered an asylum for the insane, residing Dr. Elmore Lee Gray prefers to think of it as a convalescent home, a place where you can go to rest. The patient list is kept secret, but thought to include many of the black sheep of wealthy families, because at Dorsetto, treatment does not come for free. Local author Cassandra Beauregard has now been confirmed by her own admission. She's been lauded as a powerful Creole voice and written many successful books. Lately it was reported from Hollywood that she has finished a moving picture manuscript titled Slaughter Gulch. That film is set to hit the theaters next year. I need the key.
Thanks. What are you doing? Who are you? Whoa, pardon me, excuse me. My name is Edward Carnby, private investigator. I hope you don't mind we let ourselves inside. I do mind. This is private property. You can't just barge in here. I'm sorry about all this, but I'm looking for my uncle. It's urgent, and no one was answering the door. We can't hear you knocking anymore. None of us can. Who is your uncle, darling? Jeremy. Am I right? She has that Hartwood gloom, doesn't she? That's right. I'm Emily Hartwood. I just came to make sure my uncle is alright. Well, he is unavailable right now. He will have to come back another day. Unavailable? How? Is he sleeping? We can wait. He's lost. Don't I know you from somewhere? Who's your man again, Miss Hartwood? My name's Edward Carnby. Private investigator. Splendid. Enough! All of you, get back to your rooms! McCarthy, keep your eyes on the child. And you two, please leave immediately. Look, we're not here to cause any trouble. Just let us see the old man, satisfy the curiosity of my client here, and we'll be off. Jeremy has gone missing. There's no need to worry, but it might be some time before he turns up. The whole staff is looking for him. What? He ran off? I don't have time for any of this. Please, come back tomorrow. All right, in that case, we'll just wait in his room. You don't mind, do you? It's upstairs, right? Wait, you can't. Don't worry, we'll be discreet. In the corridor. It's the first door on your left. I'll tell Dr. Gray you're here. Excellent. Thank you, madam. Look around. See if we can dig up any clues. Every night the dark man stands opaque at the threshold of my room. Counting the days until my spirit spills out of my tired shape. Only his pallid mask shelters my remaining sanity, staring directly into the face of that demonic sultan would surely sunder time itself. Would he have looked the same to my father as he struggled for his life? Does his veiled face haunt my niece quite the same way? I wish so that I could rest my soul in that sunburnt convent of Tarawea. Would I find you there, Juan? Or Signora Perosi, back from the beyond? Every night I hide from him, moving from one misshapen memory to another. Scenes conjured out of fantasy and delirium. Places I struggle to even paint. I wish I understood your death, Signora. Is there anything I could do for you but bury you in that bleak necropolis? That triumphant chapel rising above the ledges and the oven vaults shall be your sepulchre where you may rest, and I shall weep. How did you first come to understand such things, Signora? How did you know that the battered boil in the basement would lead me to Lafayette Cemetery? Or how the old upstairs clock, with its astronomical motifs, would take me to that hateful mound outside of Claremont Harbor? Those are my memories, my past. Is there perhaps a chance, if ever so small, for me to see Tarawaya? Oh, I want that more than anything. Please, let my talisman take me there. Let me sit with Juan under his Bodhi tree. Despite having sold me that talisman, 
Miss Jackson, the voodoo priestess, revealed none of her secrets to me. That's why I had to travel to Tonka. Instead, she cruelly told Baptiste, my caretaker, that he would be betrayed and killed in the most awful way, that the one he loved would pierce his thigh with a sharp spear, and that he would be devoured by his own mother. What a terrible thing to say. The people of Deceto were becoming dangerous. They do not understand what they are doing. I must do something to stop them. I tried talking to Dr. Gray, but he confuses my worries. He's caught up in treating me. How can he expect evil to be cured with medicine and conversation? The orderlies, the housekeeper, and the patients are all deranged. They will call upon evil to enter this world. All will be lost. Everything. Unless I can find the clerk, Mr. Waite. He seems to be a clear-thinking man. Maybe Beauregard. The dark man offered me a prison, and I accepted. I signed that miscarried contract and entered a dark pact. Everyone is safe, except for me. Hey, you know anything about this? Looks like some sort of talisman. No, I don't. Oh, help me out here, will you? <sighs> now, would it kill the guy to throw some of this stuff out? I'd be crazy too if I had this much junk lying around. Save this one. All right, come on. I want to go see Dr. Gray. Come on, let's go. Yeah, I'm coming. Miss Hartwood. Emily? What was that? I can't go that way. What the hell is going on? 
going on. Get inside, Combat. They're not the good guy. Are you... Is this your store? There are no owners here. We both strangers in Jeremy's store. Jeremy did this? How? The pack with the dog, man. Jeremy warned us, but we didn't think much of it. I'm Detective Edward Carnby. I was hired by Jeremy's niece to find him. Oh, yeah? How much you paying you? Hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> She's sure getting her money's worth to die. Are you a thinking man, compare? No, nah, not if I can help it. You know, I think Jeremy's hiding in a way we can't find him. He has this juju necklace that guides him. The talisman? That's right. It's some magic charm he got for Miss Jackson down the street. The voodoo priestess? You know surprising things, compare. Yeah. The Mama Loa. Here, take the key. I locked the gate to save her place from all the ghouls and goblins getting inside. Maybe if you go there, you could find some clues to show you the way. Thanks. I'll have a look. You want to come along? Nah, I'm gonna stay here for a while.
I reckon. It's the talisman, like the one in the painting. I think it's meant for the talisman. I think it needs numbers, like coordinates. Maybe there's something in Jeremy's notes. It's showing something. A place? Where is that? Detective, I was wondering when you were going to show up. Mrs. Thompson told me you were here. I understand you are working for Jeremy Hartwood's niece. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you're not wrong. We came here for her uncle. I just didn't expect... I didn't expect this. You are Dr. Gray, right? That's right. You don't happen to have some identification, Detective. I'm not keen on having strangers prying into my business. Oh, Detective Edward Carnby, Decatur Street, New Orleans. Enjoying the view carré, Detective? Those old French quarters, the voodoo people, the gangsters. I'm sure you live an exciting life. Well, that's not quite like the stories, Doc. Just trying to make a living. Aren't we all making a living? Well, welcome to Dossetto, Detective. I hope your time here will be useful. Now, what can I do for you? Why don't you tell me where I can find Jeremy Hartwood? <laughs> Why wouldn't that make for a short visit? I wish I could tell you, but I'm afraid I don't know. A drink, Detective? Anything brandy. Oh, you do belong in the French quarters, Detective. Armagnac or cognac? You know, just give me the cheap stuff. I'm not much of a connoisseur. Having low standards is not a virtue, detective. Let me see if I can broaden your perspective. What can you tell me about Jeremy? I wouldn't want to go into details about his condition. Doctor-patient confidentiality. I'm sure you understand. Sure. But he is crazy. And he's gone missing. Why? Here, try this. Ooh, it's good. Got a bite? <laughs> it's called a sidecar. The trick is not to be afraid of the tartness of the lemon. Then, for goodness sake, don't overdo the triple sec. Okay, what can you tell me about Jeremy? Ah, oh, well, let me think. He is an anxious man, constantly worried about events not presenting themselves according to his model of predestination. He complains about things not being carried out in the right order, and that something simply shouldn't be. Is any of this helpful to you? Uh, not really. Uh, I was hoping for some direction where to look next. I'm sorry. I have nothing for you then. You should talk to my orderlies. They have been looking for him for a while. Now, I'm sure they would appreciate your help. Yeah, I ran into Batiste earlier. Come to think of it, he... He might have given me a lead. Oh, excellent. So your investigation is already underway. I'm gonna go. But I'm sure we'll meet again. Looking forward to it. Safe returns.
Detective Carnby, how did you... Where did you go? I was just talking to Dr. Gray. You disappeared. No, it's not what you think. Have you... Have you found anything strange going on here? Yes. Everyone is being incredibly evasive and I can't figure out why. No, I mean something you can't explain. Paranormal, even. Detective, I really need you to get yourself together. I can't do this alone. Forget it. I'll figure it out. Do you want to come see Dr. Gray? No. I want to, I want to try something else. With his talisman, I think I can follow Jeremy, the place he mentioned in the book. What was the name? Do you remember something Spanish? T Tarawea. Yeah, that's where I need to go. Detective? Are you gonna be alright? Yeah. Of course. Go talk to Dr. Gray. We'll rendezvous later. This talisman brought me back from the French Quarter in the blink of an eye. If Jeremy can travel so easily, then he could be hiding anywhere, even Teroea. If he can do it, so can I. I just need to figure out how the talisman works. I saw your notice in the boiler room. You should know Mr. Chance won't be coming back. I got no business being in there myself, but you can take a vow from the wine cellar if you want to try to stop the steam pouring out. Be careful. Dr. Elmore Lee Gray is DeSetto's chief doctor. Accounting and all administrative work is handled by me, Paul Waits. Ma Paul, you're right about the plates on the boiler and the clock. They have been sabotaged and I think I know who did it. They have something to do with Jeremy's episodes and how he seems to disappear at night. Right now, it's important that you keep an eye out for any of the pieces. I want to find out if I can repair the plates. Let me know if you find any of them. Lottie. Tell Lottie to take a look at the well in the kitchen garden. Looks like all the patients are accounted for, except for Jeremy. There's no way I can get into this thing. Better leave it alone. I need the key. Lost Plantations of Louisiana, Thierry Briglow, 1917. The Assetto was a small plantation on the eastern shore of Lake Pontchartrain. The land was considered difficult for industry and was sold for only $30 to Elia Pickford in 1818. Pickford employed hundreds of workers from nearby New Orleans to clear the woods and build a small plantation mansion facing the lake with a striking Greek Revival temple facade. Tessetto kept a modest production of Paris tobacco and indigo that persisted up till the Civil War. During the antebellum era, Tessetto was the source of many rumors concerning voodoo and witchcraft. People who traveled the lake reported seeing people dance at night in front of bonfires, bleating and wailing. On June 17, 1862, Captain J.W. Norton of the Union Army recounts leading a raiding party from ships anchored in Lake Pontchartrain in order to seize control of Desetto and free the slaves working there. 
The captain was surprised to find the workers fighting back with unprecedented zeal. Norton's account describes his men and women as enraged with fanaticism. Pickford reportedly tried to placate the raiders, but was shot in the confusion. Captain Norton left the mansion burning and retreated to his ships with his men. Their settle was left in ruins for several decades. The ownership of the land was long disputed and returned to the Ledoux family in 1901. Several police reports were filed during the following years as the Ledoux tried to get rid of a camp of squatters on their land. The police made several visits to remove the trespassers, but the people kept returning. On November 1, 1907, Inspector Legras of the police charged a deadly attack in order to save several children kidnapped by the squatters. Many were killed, and even more were jailed. The following year, Ledoux rebuilt their chateau, incorporating the surviving stone foundation and adding a magnificent wrought iron conservatory. The farmland had been reclaimed by the surrounding woods, so it was no longer profitable to use as a plantation. Instead, the house was turned into an artist's colony. The Astarte Artist Colony was a successful group of artists, including figures such as painter Heinrich Cassel and poet Nora Keith. The group was also known for their beloved Mardi Gras crew called the Pirates of Pontchartrain. On September 29, 1915, a tropical hurricane tore through Louisiana, causing Lake Pontchartrain to flood New Orleans. Due to the remote location of their settle, it took almost two weeks for outsiders to learn that the artist's colony was abandoned. The twelve residing artists had all vanished without a trace. The empty mansion of their settle still stands on the shore of Lake Pontchartrain, with much of its temple facade intact. The Ledoux family currently has no intention of repairing the house. Everything's normal again?
key. This must be the clock that Jeremy wrote about in the compact. Looks like the plate that held the talisman in the seance room. But it's broken and missing. I need the key. You know, sorry, detective. Didn't mean to obstruct justice or anything. That's fine. You know, I'm kind of busy with my own case of a missing person. I was wondering if you've seen Grace, a girl about yay high. I can't say that I have. Why are you asking? Well, I'm looking for her. Is she in trouble? No, 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 no. Uh, she's just hiding somewhere. But we can't have a rascal like that running around unchecked at a time like this, you understand? Well, I haven't seen her. Well, let me know if you find her. I'll be around. Uh, I'll keep an eye out for your man. Jeremy, you scratch my back, detective, and I'll scratch yours. Looks like everything's back to normal here. Emily's here. Centric. What are these symbols? Looks like alchemy or star constellations. I did it! I crossed the thresholds to my intended destination without a focusing device. My talisman now knows these roads, and I have no need for the plates. I can find my way to Lafayette as easy as I find my own room. I visited the grave of my father and seen the oven waiting for me. Thank you for opening these doors. I now must summon my courage and go back to that hateful mound outside the oil rig. I hope you'll be feeling better when I return. Jeremy. These paintings got some grim looking rot on them. Artist colony. I remember hearing about their disappearance. Must have been 15 years or more now. You may need to remember how to get them out again. They are locked up for good reason. I am sure she is still able to whisper the answer in the ears of the wrong people. But not for long. I will see her burn soon enough. That black goat will be sacrificed to put an end to it all. Then it will all be over. No more Derseto, and sadly, no Astarte. Those good pirates of Ponchartrain. May you still sail the lake, until you find the shores of Hali.
think I've seen this somewhere. What the hell is going on? the clock. in the black glass. It's showing me something. It's the hallway outside Jeremy's room. another one of Jeremy's memories. Ugh. May 1923. Monday. All okay. Ready for delivery. Maintenance. Oil pump must be serviced. Any tampering causes large spills unless properly forestalled. Tuesday. Shipment delayed but delivered. Maintenance. Service bridge close to broken. Wednesday. Prospectors reluctantly agreed to show the burial mound to Mr. Hotwood, a painter, who read about our finds in the papers. He means to return tomorrow and try to find a way inside. Thursday. Mr. Hotwood's efforts delayed. The workers seemed nervous about his presence. The Hotwood promised not to return to the compound. Instead, he has taken up an offer by L'Officier, the riverboat captain, who means to pilot him to the site tomorrow morning. Hopefully, that's the end. Work can resume. Maintenance. A bridge from the oil tower to the bayou has collapsed. Sabotage suspected. This is the devil that guides us now. Hmm. I need the key.
Got it. Weak. I just need something to break it.
be a way to get to the other side. mound Jeremy talked about in his book. that thing out of my face. Who are you? What are you doing here? I'm just a detective trying to find something called Tarawea. You after Jeremy too? Why? I'm working for his niece. She wants to make sure he's all right. He might be unharmed, but far from all right. He's a curse upon Deseto. Uh, here we go again. What? Reflections on the Power of the Verb in Certain Texts by Juan Luis Jorge To act is in itself divine. Even the slightest movement of our hand is evidence of our soul in motion. Yet our free will is so easily overwhelmed by the dullness of everyday life. Our actions become rote and rigid in spite of luxury and comfort. True divinity is found in the choice of leaving the stage where we all perform. 
People who discover this freedom unexpectedly will be struck by the terror of this revelation and become paralyzed, or worse, turn to suicide. However, if you are able to weather that storm, you will discover that there is a divine path beyond that fear. There is a chance to dismount your destiny and make something new. Something that hasn't been planned for or predestined. There is difficulty in explaining this type of acting as it transcends our everyday choices. This isn't some banal decision choosing one career over the other, or even who I should marry. Leaving the stage, no matter how, isn't a matter of course correction. It's a rejection of the story that the creator is telling. went shut. It worked. The Barlow Lens. Instructions. To double the magnification of your telescope, simply fit this Barlow Lens to your instrument. Then operate the fine tuners to adjust the distance between your lenses. This is easily done while looking through your eyepiece. Simply search for a position where your picture is clear and appears flat. When correctly tuned, your telescope should present a clear picture with magnificent magnification. What's this? I don't think I have everything I need. <sighs> it's wedged shut. It worked. Detective Conby, how good of you to come. Let me pour you a drink. What happened here? This place looks like it was hit by a bomb. <laughs> Welcome to the madhouse, Detective. Thanks. Did the ceiling just collapse? I heard it was something in the attic. Something that was supposed to happen, but didn't. How that could have such consequences is beyond me. The truth is, I don't know why the room looks like this. But I bet your friend Jeremy does. You know where I could find him? Oh, somewhere in his past, I suppose. He keeps going on about that mysterious dark man. I think he is hiding from him. Or maybe he's with him. I can't really keep up. I don't worry much. Take a look around this room. You may think it looks spectacularly devastated, but I just think it's finally found its stride. It fits perfectly with the state of this place and its... loonies. The same goes for the nonsense with Jeremy. In my eyes, we finally managed to match the wild ride inside all of us. Well, I'm happy you find the evening so harmonious. I uh, hope you don't mind me setting things right. Jeremy's business, that is. This room looks beyond my capabilities. Good luck, detective. Hope to see you again soon. Yeah, evening, miss. Can I get some more of that whiskey? Go ahead, detective. 
I don't think I can stomach any more anyway. More of that aggressive rot. On the commonplace of evil, there lies virtue and stark irreverence, careless thoughts of luminous indifference. But blame not the beast we once were, which science so often wished to refer. Not the wicked full of sin, it is you who stand and grin. All our good intentions aside, whereupon we build our pride. Sunless solitude, follow not this corrupting light. Prophets of confidence always crashes out of sight. Hear me, for we all bear this mark. Thus we must remain alone in the dark. It worked.
Jeremy? Where's the body? There's something missing. This must be... Don't you worry, Grace. Go play your game, bleat and bellow with the others. I won't be jealous. There will be more masquerades. However, I would love it if you would finish my mask for the feast. With love, Ruth. That kid's room. Why does she seem so familiar? out there. You drawing something? Nothing special. I'm just bored. Do I know you from somewhere? I remember you, Mr. Conby. From where? Don't touch that. Cassandra wouldn't like it. She wouldn't like it at all. Do you know where she is? I'd rather not talk about it. It makes me upset. Besides, she'll be back after the Feast of St. John. You think? Yep. It's all on the page, Mr. Conby. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. All right. I'm gonna go now, if that's okay. I don't like to stay too long in the same place. Mr. McCoffee might find me. Hey. Does he mean to you? Not everyone needs to be saved, Mr. Conby. You should know that by now. Miss Beauregard, I picked up your medicine at the post office today. As you understand, it needs to be administered by the orderlies for your safety. I have put the box in Lottie's room for now, and I'm sure she will find you as soon as possible. Mr. Waits. It's 
it's another one of those strange... So this is where Cassandra Beauregard ended up. For some reason, I thought she died years ago. There's more of that rod again. Like it's guiding me to do something. But what? If I find the full set of bottles, then maybe I can make something out of the stains of rot. Rot made the shape of a snake. There must be something important to find here. Maybe it has something to do with the numbers on the labels. Oh. <sighs> 
black glass is showing another room. Must be a way to another one of Jeremy's memories. Good at this, Carnby. Maybe a little too good at this. The Hartwoods family crypt. Emily's family must have deeper roots in New Orleans than I thought. I figured she was a Yankee like me. this. Now what do we got here? <sighs> got it. Gets this chapel in his book, so it must be important. Looks like I'll need more medallions to open it, though.
blocked. Please don't touch her. Jeremy. What are you doing here? Everyone's looking for you. I know. It, it's all a big mess. No one understands. I, I'm just trying to keep evil at bay. Just for a little while longer. You've got to come back with me. Your niece is waiting at Dorsetto. Emily? Why would you... My letter. I keep making it worse. What is going on, Jeremy? How is any of this happening? I made... I made a terrible promise with some... The Dark Man. Who is he? No, 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 don't say his name! He can hear us! He's always listening. Jeremy... I need to understand what is going on. I promised him everything. The sun rises, I will be chained in his sunken desert temple for an eternity. But at least the evil about to awaken and to settle won't harm anyone outside of that cursed place. You're acting. 
acting crazy, Jeremy. I want to help. There's nothing you can do. Then what's all the business about Teruea? Why did you want to go there? Oh, I can't go there. Not allowed. But you wanted to. Can I go? Tell me, will it help me to break your pact? Is there something there that would help? Why would you give me hope? That's so cruel. Okay. Sounds like we're onto something here. What should Look I- Look out! Behind you! Run! Don't let him take you! Ugh! <sighs> I've seen so many strange occurrences lately. Memories explode into existence and then burn out like tired glass bulb filaments. Dreamscapes crash down from the stars and sink into the sea. Doors that lead to nowhere and absolutely everywhere at once. With all this reverie, I want to think there's a chance that you found a way to remain alive in some way I cannot fathom. Just like I've learned to navigate with my talisman, maybe you, with all your knowledge, you somehow knew a way. A way to find me again, perhaps in Terroria. Oh, my love, Jeremy. She's dead. No matter how she died, she looks peaceful now. The Astarte Artist Colony. I remember hearing about their disappearance. Must have been 15 years or more now. Telescope lens. Why would he lock that up? Jared.
Whoa, what's going on? It's dialing in something all on its own and it's showing the way to another memory? Where is that? Another world seeping into Deceto. Was this a taste of that mysterious Terrawea? Now we're talking. go. I'm glad to see you made it. I had my doubts, but the hope you instilled has yet abandoned me. I guess this must be Tarawea. Who are you? My name is Juan Luis Jorge, and this is indeed the convent of Tarawea. You'll have to excuse me, but Yermi never got your name. The name's Edward Carnby. I'm a private investigator. You're not a patient, are you? No. I'm the author of a book that Yermi once found important. How does that work? Are you part of this memory as well? Is this even a memory? I think calling me a manifestation of Yermi's subconscious would be more correct. And so is the convent of Tarawea. I'm a man Yermi has never met. And we are in a place that he has never been. Okay. So are you here to guide me or something? I have no more purpose than you do. I simply am. I will happily help you, of course, if I'm able. If you are already somehow part of Jeremy, why did he want to come here? Isn't he sort of here already? Jeremy wanted to come here because it's a representation of his mind at peace. When Dr. Gray asks him to find his focus during his sessions, this far-flung convent is what Jeremy imagines. He is under the impression that if he could physically come here, he would reach a perfect equanimity. A spiritual apotheosis. You don't think it would work? Jeremy subconsciously knows it's just wishful thinking. He can't come here. Despite the pathways opened by the dark man between their seto and Jeremy's psyche, it's simply not possible. But I'm here. <laughs> Indeed. It's a shame it's just another place for you, detective. Otherwise, you could have become a Buddha. 
Always a bridesmaid, never a blushing bride. Am I right? <laughs> I, yes, I suppose so. You'll have to chase enlightenment elsewhere. So what's the next best thing? What can I do here? You should seek out the convent library and try to find the truth about Yermi's relationship with the Dark Man. It's the sort of knowledge he represses and is unable to reflect on. Will it tell me how to break the pact? Perhaps. At least you'll have something to confront Yermi with. Wait, why can't you just tell me? I don't know such things. You'd be better off consulting the texts of Dr. Freud if you want such answers. <laughs> no thanks, I hate shrinks. There is another thing you should know about the library. He is here as well. The Dark Man has been working his way through the text for a long, long time. He's here? How am I supposed to get past him? Be careful, Detective. Oh, jeez. Just perfect. You have any advice on how to deal with the Dark Man? Hmm. I suppose suppression could work. Try not to pay him any attention. There's something missing. The great library was endless, beautiful, and terrible. An Akashic record for the universe inside the mind of Jeremy Hotwood. Now corrupted by a story forced upon him, told by a maniacal liar, an evil conjured by science and secrecy. I will suspend a room and lock away the foundation of his character. Its key will be left to the librarian, the only thing invisible to the Fowler.
It was in the hot autumn that I went through the night with the restless crowds. He was a kind of itinerant showman who held forth in public halls and aroused widespread fear. The New Orleans address of the event is lost, but I remember distinctly the Prext shipping company pressing their contribution. Hey. <laughs> Detective! What? What? I hope you found what you were looking for. I fear there is no one. <laughs> So close. There must be something I can work with. Come on, Carmby, think. Think. The shipping come. Prexed. Right. Good luck, detective. God, you're here, detective. Sitting all alone in a place like this. I'd never live it down if the papers got wind of it. Hey. Ruth, right? Oh, don't pretend you don't know. I'm sure you have a whole file on me by now, detective. I suppose we weren't formally introduced. I'm Ruth Talon. Miss Ruth Talon, in case you're wondering. Edward Carnby. Enchanté. Are you sure? I had too many already. Nice. It's good. I know. I have great taste, detective. I heard you're trying to break Jeremy's promise to the dark man. Yeah. Do you know anything about that kind of stuff? No. But it makes you wonder. If he made a promise, can't he simply stand by his words? Look, I'm just trying to get Jeremy out of a bad deal, so he'll come back with us to New Orleans. Well, if all fails... What are you doing? <laughs> It's a sign of submission to the Dark Man. I saw it in a dream once. What? You don't know the Prext Shipping Company by any chance? I do. They made big money during the war. But their waterfront office is just over there. How did you do that? Do what, detective? Bon chance. Hey, have you seen Emily Hartwood anywhere? Are you trying to make me jealous, detective? No, I haven't seen your doll anywhere. Shipping Company. According to the book in Tarawea, the Dark Man is connected to a performance that Jeremy went to somewhere. It's locked from the other side. Be another way inside.
inside the warehouse. The office must be upstairs.
Hey, I always wanted to try one of these. Our ship was raided while in dock. All of his things were recovered, but blood was shed. Several men were carried into the Mississippi River and drowned by ones who live in the deep. All items have now been signed and delivered. Now let's keep the papers safe. What is left? Later is right. And hell is back again. Cargo Manifesto, September 19, 1892. Bragg Shipping Company delivered four steamer trunks, one Egyptian sarcophagus, and a large wooden crate belonging to the showman called the Black Pharaoh, performing at Gaitin Street. Here we go. The address where Jeremy first encountered the Dark Man. Like the fog cleared up. Tell me what this is all about. Welcome, detective. To the greatest show this side of the Mississippi. Now the hotel. The Black Pharaoh. The ancient magician who lived a thousand lives and wore a thousand masks. I can see why you settled on calling him the Dark Man. Saves your breath. So, you got scared by a stage magician. And now, he's living inside your head. You can mock me, detective. But you would be the crazy one to think his presence can be ignored. Look where we are! We didn't get to finish our last conversation, did we? You were about to tell me how to break the contract with the Dark Man. No can't. Do it. 
Turn her loose on the world. So many innocent would die. But there is a way to break out of the deal. There is. You offered me a way out. Steps to take. What are they? You'll never find them. They're forever entombed in his sunken desert temple. Jeremy, I'm not your enemy. Tell me where to go. How do I find the temple? No, we can't. I have to make this sacrifice. God damn it, Jeremy. I'm gonna save you. Don't worry. How do you save someone who doesn't want to be saved? Well, he's gonna get saved no matter what. I just need to find the temple somehow. Sunken Desert Temple. I better get down there. Here we go.
operation. Good work. This is it. This is where the contract is hidden. But how do I get to it? Hmm.
Acknowledge psychological trauma, break through barriers of self-deceit, temperamentic behavior. These are the dark man's terms. The contract. Huh? Hey, detective? What are you doing? Oh, I found something. Great. Was it alcohol? God, no. I just got the wind knocked out of me. I think I know how to break the contract with the Dark Man. What exactly does that mean? Everything going back to normal. Uh, all right. Uh, I found some more information on Dorsetto and the patients. There are some seriously strange things going on here. I'm pretty sure two of the patients are dead and maybe even the clerk. Oh yeah, I kind of just gave up on worrying about that. Well, just keep your eyes open, I suppose. What were you doing again? Jeremy made a pact with the Dark Man to keep all the madness locked inside Dorsetto. All right. I'm gonna break it. I just have to... Where is it? Where's the talisman? It's around your neck. Ah! Oh. Ah! Oh. I worry, detective. Don't, I'm fine. I worry that you're not much help on this case. At least you're a good distraction. Trust me, you're getting your money's worth. At this rate, I'm an absolute bargain. Be around here somewhere. He wouldn't leave this house. I don't know what to think anymore. You run into that deck, fella. Who is he? Can he be trusted? I think he wanted a good guy. Well, you know, like us. Will he be all right with her coming? Praise the mother. He don't need to know about all that. Just calm down. It ain't time yet. God. Hurts. As far as I can tell, Detective Combi seems to be solving problems, not causing them. Just be ready in case he starts anything. The two orderlies still hadn't found Jeremy. Conby figured this was good news. Emily had reminded him about some strange deaths at Dossetto, and Conby wasn't sure who he could trust.
Lunacy in the Astarte Artist Colony, a monograph by Yael Klein. In early 1909, the old Derseto plantation outside of New Orleans was turned into an artist's colony. Three famous European artists rented the house and the surrounding land from the owner, the Ledoux family. The colony was chiefly run by Sebastian Cortez, who was playfully dubbed the captain by his collaborators, William Argus and Heinrich Kassel. The colony existed for six years, until one day all twelve members disappeared without a trace. It is widely believed that their disappearance is connected to the disastrous hurricane that passed through on September 29, 1915, but nothing truly supports this claim. What is known is their frequent participation in New Orleans nightlife, their love for hosting parties, and their elaborate contributions to the Mardi Gras parades as the Pirates of Pontchartrain. Accounts of their lifestyle can be found in almost every gossip column. It can effectively be summed up as carefree and bohemian. In late June 1909, the name Astarte first appeared in the newspapers. Cortez said the name came to him as he was painting. There is never any claim to knowing about the ancient Phoenician fertility goddess with the same name before this time. His fellow colonist Heinrich Kassel did know, because he later produced sculptures that show clear references to ancient idols of the goddess. It's impossible to know for sure how this name suddenly made an appearance, but it is interesting because of their Seto's history. I don't want to run into the orderlies right now. I'm not sure I can trust them. I think Dr. Gray might be in there. Perfect time to snoop around his office, then. It's blocked.
There must be a spare key to Dr. Gray's office in here somewhere. I don't have the combination for this, or maybe Jeremy did. Detective Conby, good to see you again. Solved your case yet? I'm trying. Hey, Grace, you okay? Oh, she is just peachy, Detective. Are you looking forward to the Feast of St. John, Grace? I can't wait. Kids, ain't they great? What exactly are you planning for tonight? Oh, not much. We eat, we drink. A tribute to the wishing tree in the conservatory, the usual. Then why all the excitement? There is just something about tonight, something that's different. I think we all feel it. Besides, we got ourselves some new words for the prayer thanks to your buddy Jeremy. She'll come and turn the world inside out, and things will begin again. That sounds strangely threatening. You should come. Oh, God damn it, Grace. Stay put for once. McCarthy was a deadbeat. His mere presence annoyed Conby. It was like watching the worst version of himself mock him by simply being worthless. While Conby enjoyed watching the child outplay the drunkard, there was something terrifyingly familiar about Grace. It was taunting him, like he was supposed to remember but couldn't. There's something missing. Better hold on to these. Wouldn't want them to get lost. Where's that from? I did this. I wrote that. I 
recognize this view. I know the combination. I carry it with me. The empty room always felt familiar. It had a mild fragrance of crushed leaves and wet sand that somehow convinced visitors that they belonged. It wasn't real, of course, but it was more real than many other things you could find. Detective, I have made many discoveries in my case. The child we want is safe, thanks to good people like me and you. We are so similar, but you don't see all the things I do. To find your man, Jeremy, you also need to look for the girl. It has always been that way. The young deliver us all. You should have a look in my room. There's a piece of the puzzle you will need. Take care now. My coffee. Oh. Oh, surprisingly neat. Maybe I've been selling that old barfly short. Sometimes, I think this place makes me worse. That Dossetto might be my grave. A coffin made of ostentatious architecture. A Taj Mahal for the drunken depressed. There's something about Dossetto. Something about Dr. Gray. Like we all pretend that we're here to get better. When in fact we are here to be forgotten. Looks like McCarthy has something hidden inside. Why would McCarthy lock this up? Was he trying to keep Grace from completing the shame? If so, couldn't she have just made another drawing? What the hell happened in here?
There's something missing. This looks familiar. How am I back at the office? How long had it been since I drowned myself in drink and depression? And it all felt so peaceful, slipping away into oblivion. A welcoming dark voice wrapped around my mind like a heavy blanket. It turned off suddenly as I woke up from the sound of my office door closing shut. A messenger had left a telegram from Mrs. Saunders. She had a lead on where to find her husband and her kidnapped daughter. God, I used to drink so much back then. When was this exactly? What case was I working? kid got taken by her father, headed out of state, but he had made a mistake by selling a painting that his wife actually cared about to a collector named Thornhill to fund his venture. That's how I tracked him down. case can't be squeaky clean. <laughs> Mr. Saunders had sold a valuable painting to Thornhill, hoping the money would carry him to wherever he was going. The painting, now leaning on an easel in Thornhill's bedroom, had a certain mesmerizing gloom that seemed to call out to me telling me I was needed for something important. I felt myself falling into the painting, only being brought back by Thornhill, thrusting an address to a Hotel St. George into my hand and asking me to get the hell out.
On my way to the hotel, the morning day. I owed them money, a lot of it. I can't remember what for. Probably some dumb gambling debt growing in size for each payment missed. I punched one of them out, and I sent the others packing. It was a stupid move. They'd be back. Head strike. It was him. I could feel it. It was the kidnapper I was hunting. I put on my knuckles and hurried up to his room. Something about that name, Ted Stryker, rings a bell. It feels vaguely familiar. this room, but I didn't catch up with them here. I must have followed them, but where? That's right, he was running away, ditching his old life and marriage in New Orleans to find something better in Tallahassee. And he took his daughter with him against the will of the mother. That's why she hired me. But I stopped him. I caught up with him at the Pearl River Bridge. Pearl River. This is where I caught up with them. This is what the dark man wanted me to revisit. But I'm still not seeing it. What am I forgetting? Thank you. 
I can't believe I didn't recognize you. I looked a little different back then, I suppose. I mean, is any of this real? How do you mean? This day just... So much is happening. I can't... I think I've lost my head. Do you need me to apologize? I mean... I am sorry. I don't think I need to begin to explain. You, you're just a kid, Grace. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean for it to happen. Lies. More lies. No, really. I thought I was being a good guy by handing you over to your mother. I didn't know. I, I couldn't have known that she wouldn't care about you. I don't know how this works. What is this for? Some form of admission of guilt. Maybe acceptance. It's what the dark man wants. I guess we just watch my father die again then. You think he's alive? I know he is. He's down there, scared that he won't be able to get out. That he will drown with his daughter again. What are you saying? We gotta save him! We? Do it yourself! I'm down there with him, remember? Can I really save them? This all happened so long ago. I have to find a way to get down there. I have to see it with my own eyes. There was a boat at the house where I entered. If I can raise the bridge, I should be able to get to the car. This must be where the bridge is operated. Nothing's happening. It's like something's holding it back.
Conby had run their car off the bridge. He pulled Grace out of the... Are you okay? Don't leave me alone. What the hell have you been doing? What's going on here? Look at this mess! I, I, I'm sorry, Mrs. Thompson. Don't make me kick you out of this house! Now get out! Hey, Detective. Mr. Carnby. I'm really worried about you. I'm okay. I just need to catch my breath for a moment. This place? It's... There are some very disturbed figures around here. And I don't think it's just the patients. I've been reading some things about how Dressetto has a deranging effect on people. I think it might explain... things. What? Just take it easy, okay? I'm gonna go find a way into Dr. Gray's apartment. I wanna know what he's hiding. Emily, don't worry. I think I'm close. I'm gonna set everything right. Just be careful. I got a job to do. I don't have the combination for this. But maybe Jeremy did. I need the key.
there's something missing. Jeremy knew that the only one who could help him now was the guest in room number three. The room seemed to have been empty for so long. But that wasn't allowed to be true. The story needed to be different. To include something from the outside, he would bring the guest back to room three and show them what was in that safe. Nine, one, three. But those were not the right numbers. That was the combination for the safe in the clerk's office. It worked. The last guest in the empty room suffered from severe maladaption. I must write this down, because if I understand the condition sufficiently, it could make me deny this fact at a later date. And there is reason for me to think I may come to suffer the consequences from this dysfunction, as some who came in contact with the guest seemed to adopt a new world view, in which everything was predetermined, but broken. Upon accepting this world view, some memories became unmanageable, and later rejected. I do not know what this means. I cannot even remember the fate of the guest. I think they were simply misplaced one day and forgotten. Uh. Just like all documents pertaining to this guest, they have all been destroyed, or they never existed in the first place. Who wrote this? There has never been a guest in the empty room. Dr. Gray's office, all to myself. I have finished tidying up Miss Beauregard's belongings. I will leave it to you to contact her agent and have them collect her things. I found one of Grace's drawings she might want back, along with this key in her room, which I believe you've been looking for, Mrs. Thompson. Let's see if we can figure this guy out. Dearest Dr. Manzetti, I find myself in a losing battle with my patient. As I've disclosed in my previous letter, his delusions have him completely captured. It's bad enough that he is torturing himself with paranoia, but his madness turns out to be quite persuasive to others, effectively laying the ground for mass delusion. I am writing to you in hope that you can give me some guidance. Beyond my ambition to avoid devastating surgery on my patient, I have grown worried about my own defenses. The words of my patient are deranged, yet they often resonate with something primitive within me. I have tried photographing his brain with X-rays. 
It was surprisingly difficult to get good results. Dark blotches on the plates kept obscuring all details. My patient looked at the bad plates and cried out in terror, telling me the dark areas was the shadow of the worm eating him from inside. I could not see anything out of the ordinary. I hope this is a sign that my mind is not as receptive to the madness as I had feared. After further inquiry, my patient described the shadows inside his mind as some kind of chthonic monstrosity that wants to undermine his sanctuary. This is clearly a reference to a place he calls Teroea, a sort of library or convent that works as a psychological haven. With this imaginary haven threatened by this Chthonian, he has now constructed another less pleasant hiding spot. Lately, he has been bringing up a metaphor of a steamboat that has run aground, that he feels like he needs to start the engines and reverse, but he is afraid that the hole in the hull would cause the whole ship to sink. I've been watching him turn this metaphor into reality for the last week. He knows it's made up, but he is doubling down, trying to make it a real memory. I feel certain that this is my chance to break through the barriers of his self-deceit. This is where McCarthy has hidden my favorite young. It's very important. This much more. This has to end. Radiography, patient Jeremy Hartwood, date June 14, 1930. Plates, Jeremy's skull proved difficult to capture properly. Partial radiographs worked best. A complete picture of the brain can be assembled by piecing three plates together. Observations, even when looking at an assembled version, a shadow covers significant parts of Jeremy's brain possible tumor, but more likely that the equipment is failing. Jeremy reacted strongly to the pictures and claimed to see a giant clay worm eating and displacing his memories. 
Notes. While this exercise has left me nowhere closer to an answer, I feel confident that a Burkhart lobotomy should sever all necessary parts. Hypothetical psychosurgery based on the ideas by Burkhart and the St. Petersburg research could end up saving Jeremy's mind. Severing the connections around the frontal lobe would certainly solve most mental afflictions. The procedure would be brutal in performance, as well as in efficiency. An ice pick pushed through the edge of the eye and into the skull would untether the nerves like Alexander cutting the Gordian knot. As this would likely leave Jeremy in a very different condition, all other paths should first be explored. The medical instrument I would need for this lobotomy is missing and I should have Waits order a new one. Mind if I do? That's better.
Why does this keep happening? What am I supposed to do? And we're back here. Well, perfect time to have a look around this place. Jeremy's hiding, right? Hello? Is anyone there? Jeremy? I need help! Wait! Can you hear me? I'm stuck in the mud and the fire is taking Jeremy, me! Where are you? The motor is dead! I can't do anything more! Hang on, Jeremy. I'll figure something out. I'll get the boat running. boat's wedged itself right into the bayou. If I get the motor started, I could try reversing back into the river. Jeremy, where are you?
Pretty weak. I just think.
Thirty years ago, Frederick needed me to die. You're not making any sense, Jared. Come back. Find hey. your focus. Hey! I cheated everyone. I didn't play my part. Hey! I escaped hey. my doom. My destiny. I did. Find hey. your focus. Hey, I'm right here. What the hell is going on? Now everything is wrong. Nothing is in place. Hey. I'm right here! Calm down, the hell is going John B. What do you want? Did... Were you... Were you not talking to Jeremy right now? I haven't seen Jeremy all day. Are you all right, Detective? No. Actually, actually, I don't... I don't think so. Well, maybe. I'm gonna go... Look for Jeremy. Good. Let me know if you find him. That was Jeremy's self-deceit? A steamboat stuck in the mud? I'm not gonna pretend I understand any of that. What a bunch of psychoanalytic nonsense. Jeremy was called... Jeremy was calling out for help. But Combi couldn't figure out where the voice was coming from. For a moment, Combi wondered if the boat itself was Jeremy, or if he was below it somehow. It didn't matter right now. Jeremy was clear on one thing. He wanted Combi to get the steamboat running and out of the mud. Detective, am I glad to see you. Lock the door, will you? I don't think Dr. Gray would appreciate us snooping around. What's going on here? This feels so strange. Have you found anything? What? Y yeah, uh, yeah, I've seen some things. Okay. Let me know if there is anything you want to talk about. There's a book missing. What did you do? I was just rearranging the books. Well, come on, let's check it out.
I think I'm beginning to understand. Dr. Gray is dealing with some kind of mass delusion. Good to finally meet you, Mr. Hartwood. I'm here on the behalf of your brother, Philip. You were expecting me, weren't you? Yes. You're from Desetto, no? That's right. I just wanted to ask you a few questions to see if there is anything I can do to help you and your family. Okay. I understand you're full of imagination. You make up a lot of things. I suppose. And you obsess over them, blurring reality and fiction. Sometimes. Do you want to tell me about the Dark Man? No. No, I, I don't. That's all right. Perhaps there is something else you can tell me. Something you know to be made up, but you hold dear. Juan? John? Who's John? No, Juan Luis Jorge. Oh, wait there a moment. Here, take a look. Is he... Oh, he is the author. It's a magnificent book. Life-changing, even. The real Juan is long dead, but I like to think of him as my, my friend. My most beloved friend. I see. Do you often do this? Fantasize about people you read about? No. No. Well, there is Jacob. Who is Jacob? Turn to the last page. Oh, it's a newspaper article. The Prisoner of Ice, Jacob Van Ostart. Is he also your beloved friend? Oh, no, Doctor. Not at all. He is the fire that fights fire. Yes, I think it's clear your overstimulated imagination, this mania, needs to be tempered for you to live a normal life. I know your family calls it the Hartwood Curse, but I want you to know that there is nothing supernatural about your condition. It's all inside your head. And with that, I'm very qualified to deal with. In time, you will be cured. In time, in time. Yes, in time we will exercise all your demons, all the dark men. Yeah! Please, Mr. Hartwood, calm yourself. What happened? Oh, don't you worry your little head about it, Miss Hartwood. Your uncle and I just had our first breakthrough. That mark on the floor looks like talisman positions, but from which direction should I look? The Snake Dagger, a monograph by Yael Klein. In Ludwig Prinz's book on pagan rituals, called The Mystery of the Grave, as translated by Nicholas Vahi, there are several references to a sacrificial dagger called the Snake Dagger. It has long been thought of as a poor translation of the original text, that it would be more appropriate with Worm Dagger from the Latin Vermis Cultrum. This seems natural following the recent consensus that the original title of Prinz's book the Vermis Mysteris should literally translate to the Mystery of the Worm. However, this would take away from Vahi's great effort at translating the underlying meaning of the words and revealing several cultural beliefs. While Prin certainly was using the term worm as a symbol or synecdoche for death and the dead, which is made clear by the contents of the book, in the case of the dagger, we shouldn't be too hasty to dismiss his translation. Reading through Vahi's correspondence with his patron, it appears that he had more than just the Latin text at his disposal. Vahi had dug up Prin's living relatives and uncovered several cross-referenced historical texts and an actual snake dagger. The dagger was dated to the early Middle Kingdom of Egypt and had such a clear shape of a wave that Vahi considered calling it the sinusoidal blade. Knowing the full story, it seems prudent that he chose to translate it as snake and not worm. 
There are several reasons why this choice of word helps us understand the pagans that Prin's book attempts to describe. The symbolic value of the shape becomes more apparent when reading about the use for the dagger. In the passage of possession and exorcism, we find the snake dagger poisons the poisoner within the victim and is therefore pacified. Where the literal text would tell us that the worm dagger trumps the demon possessing the victim, it tells us nothing of their reasoning, only that somehow this dagger wins against the demon, like it had the better hand in poker. Vahi's translation allows us to follow the underlying logic to the ritual magic that is being performed. Poison the poisoner. Sounds like fighting fire with fire. That to hurt the demon possessing its victim, the priests would have to fight back with a power that is known to the evil they are fighting. The snake dagger is therefore not only a good way to describe its form, but it also helps us understand how it could be thought of as a useful tool for exorcism. Finally, it also helps us understand their relationship to lunacy, that it was thought of as something poisoning the mind rather than controlling it. What is also interesting to note is that the possessed are always considered poisoned in their head and not their heart. The snake dagger always went to the eye of the possessed, leaving them partially blind, if they had the good luck to survive. What were you saying about mass delusion? Dorsetto seems to have a deranging effect on people living close by. It has a history of creating cults devoted to some nature goddess. Even the name Dorsetto refers to the cult existing here before the Civil War. Dorsetto was the name of an ancient fertility goddess worshipped in Syria. Dr. Gray and his friends, however, seem to prefer... the black goat of the woods with a thousand young, or Shubnigroth. And that name can only have come from my uncle's twisted mind. Has that been there this whole time? It, it can't be. Who is this? Jeremy? Jeremy is with the dark man. You can't save him. Well, I've done everything you wanted so far, and there's just one more thing on the list. I expect him to keep his promise and return Jeremy unharmed. Get out, detective. While you still can.
You okay? You look a little frazzled. Just... stupid telephone. I know. I tried calling the police earlier. The telephone is completely dead. It's not... Yeah, no, the telephone isn't working. Miss Hartwood, I think you're gonna want to see this. Is there something in the closet? Yeah, there is. You don't see the very obvious gate leading to whatever Jeremy's madness is serving up next? I don't understand. Are you making some kind of fashion metaphor? I'm sorry, I don't have time for this. Can you just tell me what you're doing? You don't see this. It's fine. It's fine. Catch you later. Are you going inside the closet? Yeah. You got a problem with that? No. Do what you think is right, detective. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Goodbye, Miss Harwood.
Hey you! What are you doing here? What is this place? Turn back, detective. You're not wanted here. Whoa, take it easy. I'm not your enemy. Oh, you're wrong, detective. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Line, Jeremy, or ah, maybe that is what you need to temper that mania of yours. Want from me? 
You want me to lose my mind? Oh, my love! Doctor! Baptiste! Quick! Jesus. What were you thinking, Carpet? I thought you'd be knocked out for the rest of the night. <laughs> Come on out and join us, will you? I'll save you some gumbo. Good to have you back. You gave us all a good scare. What happened? You had a psychological breakdown. Sorry for manhandling you, but you are being violent. You stabbed Jeremy and then punched Dr. Gray. Are they... okay? Jeremy's a little strange. But everything's back to normal. Really? All thanks to you, Combat. You wanna try standing up? Well, if it isn't the hero of the day. How are you feeling, Detective? Never better. How about you two? Hey, Jeremy, I didn't do too much damage, did I? Things are fine. Very quiet. What's up with him? Painkillers? No. You see, despite you having the finesse of a one-eyed butcher, you managed to lobotomize dear Jeremy. I did what? It's actually quite impressive. It's not like I hadn't considered it myself. I just wish Jeremy could have been helped without reducing his personality to that of an oyster. But he's gonna live. Of course. As long as someone keeps feeding him, he'll outlive the best of us. Does Emily know about Jeremy's condition? Yes. She seems to be handling it quite well under the circumstances. Good to see you back on your feet, Detective. Have some gumbo. Thanks. I'll save it for later. Everyone knows what to do? Y'all know the new words. Mrs. Thompson, we talked about this. I'm not sure everyone is comfortable. Doctor, I insist. This is important. We've waited for so long, Doctor. Let's just go with the old song. Not every change is an improvement. Boss, good or bad, we need to move forward. All in, Doc. Let's bet it all. But we don't know what we're dealing with. It'll be okay, Doctor. Better even. their praises in abundance to the black goat of the woods. Hear us, brother. Take pity on us. Take pity on us. Hear us, brother. Take pity on us. Hear us, brother. And take pity on us. Take pity on us. Take pity on us. And take pity on us. Take pity on us. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Are you crazy? This feels like the happy call, Grace. Stop! Come with me! Get over here! Jeremy, come with me! Jeremy, come here! No! There has to be a death of that! We're Let that monster leave Dorsetto. I have to stop it.
protect them. Oh, what the hell was that? I try to tell you. There was so much evidence. Their devotion to the black goat was like nothing I've ever seen before. I felt so dumb believing any of it, but I'm glad I did. Are you okay? Everything is out of order. This isn't the way the story goes. I shouldn't be alive. Yeah. Well, you're welcome, buddy. How are you doing, sweetie? I kind of like it. You ruined everything, but I'm not mad. All right, you ready to head back to New Orleans? Come on, Jeremy. We're leaving. Can I come? I thought you said you didn't need saving. Don't leave her. She's important. Of course we're taking her with us. 